Well, I have I have noon, so uh, let's not uh, let's not dawdle, uh, so we can uh, take full advantage of our hour. So, uh, if everyone can hear me, uh, welcome to our ongoing series of panel discussions uh, through the Science Circle, and welcome um, our topic today is um, sort of recent developments in material science or interesting topics in material science. Um, uh, we have uh, two uh, distinguished uh, guests uh, today that I'm going to be interviewing. Before we begin, I do want to remind everyone that the Science Circle is a grant-funded nonprofit uh, dedicated to the development of virtual world platforms for education. So I'll ask you to be on your best behavior. And uh, also, um, we are speaking through a, a, a Zoom voice link up, um, but I do want to remind uh, all of the attendees to uh, keep your microphones off. If you want to speak, um, please use a text in the nearby chat and we'll be happy to uh, answer your questions um, uh, that way through the text. Um, so uh, with those announcements done, I would like to introduce our speakers. We have uh, Mike Shaw, who is a educator and scientist at the Southern Illinois uh, University of Edwardsville and is a uh, well known to the uh, science uh, circle here. And uh, we also have uh, Kurt Winkleman, who also should be known to Science Circle. Um, he's a professor of chemistry and head of the uh, Department of Chemistry um, at uh, Valdosta uh, College. Um, and uh, he has a, a, a degree uh, in chemistry from Virginia Tech and a PhD from Auburn University. Uh, Kurt also um, under, apparently, as I understand it from grant funding, created the chemistry region uh, here in Second Life, uh, which is uh, currently actually being operated um, by Mike. Um, and uh, we have a, a one year a, a commitment uh, through his university to uh, to keep that going. So uh, so we have a, a really so really we have the uh, two gentlemen uh, who are really responsible for keeping uh, chemistry and chemistry education active in Second Life here to uh, talk with us today. And our, as I mentioned, our subject is material science. So, um, Mike, I wanted to start with you. I think a good place for us to start is a definition. So tell us a little bit um, uh, what you consider a good definition for material science um, and uh, uh, maybe a little bit about your interest in it. Okay, well, I'll speak a little bit off the uh, cuff for, um, for, for, for this, uh, you know, um, as chemists, um, everything around us, <laughs> and, um, you know, everything that exists to a chemist is a material, but some materials are more useful than others, right? Um, you know, my students in my lab make all sorts of materials all the time, and uh, some of them we just uh, scrape off and put in the waste because they're not really useful for, for, for anything. At least we hope not. Uh, because if they were useful for something, then uh, we've missed an opportunity. Um, for um, what I think of as uh, formal material science, uh, there has to be an application. So uh, uh, it's not just enough that like a material that has a well-defined uh, composition and exists. Uh, it has to be able to do something. So. Um, you know, to quote, quote a recent article in ACS Central Science, uh, you know, finding the best material for a specific application is the ultimate goal of materials discovery. Uh, so I think the applications are an important part of this. Right. So hmm, coming up with an actual definition. Okay, well, a, um, a material uh, is a uh, substance uh, which can be uh, used 
for a useful purpose. Our uh, side of sort of the sine qua non of materials. Uh, Kurt, do you have any reactions or do you want to uh, um, uh, add to that in terms of your thoughts about uh, materials? Yeah, um, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, material scientists, um, you know, they, they study materials. Um, you know, they, you, I could imagine doing some studies on materials just out of your own curiosity, but for the most part, it's, it's sort of purpose driven. Um, I, I'd also add that, you know, the, the discipline of material science um, encompasses chemistry and physics, um, really, really all the sciences. I mean, we're, we're now trying to make, um, you know, artificial tissue and, you know, now we're, you know, we're getting into building materials uh, that have that are replicating biological um you know naturally occurring materials um and so i, I would say it it, mm. it is a, a interdisciplinary um subject that uh, that you know includes engineering sciences all sorts of things yes that's an excellent point in fact um i uh, considered seeing if we could invite an, an engineer to join us, because uh, I do think it is very interdisciplinary. And that's also a nice segue uh, to our next topic. Uh, Kurt, can you tell us, talk to us a little bit maybe about um, uh, basic versus applied research in material science? And I'm sort of particularly interested um, in whether, um, for example, um, a researcher sort of um, maybe perhaps has in mind a, sp a specific uh, set of properties that he wants to try to design a material to have, um, or whether materials are more often maybe discovered serendipitously, um, maybe accidentally in a lab, and then its properties are recognized uh, and then maybe explored in more depth. And maybe there's an interplay between the two of those. Yeah, um, and I'll also just add as a side, the, the, the chat is, is pretty awesome. Um, you guys are making me laugh. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was kind of looking up, you know, what are the, some of the formal definitions of, of basic and applied research as I prepared for this. And, you know, one of the things that, that struck me was the idea that basic research, um, I, you know, is motivated simply by um, seeking knowledge for its own sake. So when um, you know, it, it's, it's the basic research and the search for knowledge that, um, you know, cause people to want to study just how semiconductors behave. Um, weren't necessarily any uses for semiconductors when they were doing this, um, or, um, you know, how, like why the, the scientists a hundred years ago who were studying developing quantum mechanics, um, there was no application for that. It was it was just fascinating. Um, or, you know, Einstein and relativity. These are all examples of basic research, which was conducted simply to, you know, simply to say that, that we now understand things better, um, which, you know, is kind of, a, it's a noble goal, but it also has some very practical benefits because um, basic research really lays a foundation um, for, advancing science or engineering in a particular direction, which is what you would do in applied research, where you, you say, you know, uh, you know I, I want to do, I want a material that does this. Um, what material should I use? Or, you know, what material should I, should I work with? And you would then look at the basic research that has been done and you would say, oh, I want to use a semiconductor because I'm trying to make light emitting diodes. And light emitting diodes would not exist without our understanding of how the electronic properties of semiconductors. Um, you know, if you want to make a super precise, like atomic clock, um, you have to understand quantum mechanics, but making a super precise atomic clock is like, it's really useful for things like GPS and, uh, you know, keeping track of, of things, you know, to, to very precise, uh, uh, measurements. Um, and then I'll, I'll just add keeping satellites in orbit um, relies on relativity. 
So, you know, these, these ideas of basic research, um, I think basic research sometimes gets a bad rap um, because it's not practical. It's not, uh, you know, doesn't accomplish anything, but actually as someone in the chat said earlier, um, you, you don't know what you're going to need in the future. Um, we, we just can't know that. Um, I mean, who, who would have guessed we needed like materials for touch screens for iPads because there were no iPads at the time. Um, but we had that basic research on how to design those materials already accomplished. So it was easy for Apple to quickly put together an iPad. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the difference between basic and, and applied, but um, they, there is an interplay. If, if certainly basic research helps you get to applied um, or, or answer the, the, the question or solve the problem you need. Um, but as you, as you work on your applied research, you might find that there are some deficiencies in the basic research. You might say, hey, you know, we, we just need to learn more about this type of material because I think this material might be important someday or might be important now, but we just don't know anything about it. So you get a bunch of scientists doing basic research on that and, you know, then it kind of goes back, ebbs back and forth. Uh, yeah, when I was uh, sort of uh, prepping for today, um, I looked at several articles, you know, kind of lists of interesting materials and things like that. And you do come across a couple that like seem really interesting and cool, but, but often the description would say there is no known use for this material. <laughs> it's just yeah. really, it's just really interesting. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think materials like graphene and uh, nanotubes, um, uh, you know, buckyballs and so forth, um, that sort of organized carbon, were discovered uh, by accident um, and then sort of discovered to have these super interesting properties. Um, and I think uh, maybe also the fact, uh, I remember in the 90s there was fantastic interest in ceramics as high temperature superconductors. And I think that property of ceramics was discovered by accident. So those things kind of come out of basic research, mm -hmm. you know, and then, um, and then as the properties are discovered, they, um, people um, work with them to try to find applications for them to right. take advantage of those properties. It's actually really important when you're doing basic research to keep an open mind uh, to, because sometimes uh, the problem you're working on can result in a solution to another problem that uh, you may not even know exists. And, uh, you know, the key mm -hmm. to being really successful at basic research is to have a broad enough background uh, to be able to recognize when uh, something that you've made is uh, really what someone else has been uh, looking for rather than like what you have been looking for. Like the story um, with Bakelite. Um, Bakelite uh, is an early plastic. I think it's early thermosetting uh, plastic. Uh, you just make big radios out of it, right? Um, and, you know, that was one that was discovered by accident. I think it's uh, benzene, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, and formaldehyde that uh, gives you uh, that particular resin. I think there are some other, uh, some recent uh, uh, very strong plastics that have been developed uh, recently, too, that withstand very high temperatures, for example. And so, uh, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe your favorite new materials or maybe what you're working on currently? Um, or uh, any, any specific materials that you kind of want to, let's kind of get into it here and start talking about some cool stuff. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you're interested in. Okay, well, um, I'm an inorganic chemist. So uh, there are some really wonderful new materials that are uh, inorganic based uh, and uh, which uh, people are uh, researching uh, so, so as to uh, be able to solve uh, current problems. Uh, one thing I'll, uh, one, one, one that I'll describe is uh, metal organic frameworks. Uh, think of a rock. Well, a rock, what it's made of, uh, like uh, something like um, granite, you might have aluminosilicates. So it's got aluminum and silicon and oxygen that are uh, bound to each other in a particular pattern. 
And uh, there's maybe some iron in there or some um, sodium or potassium in there to balance charge out. Um, this is an inorganic chemical. Um, but the thing is that there's not really a lot of space in between the silicons or aluminums. Uh, they're joined by oxygen atoms, uh, and so everything's all cramped up together. Uh, maybe if we can uh, think of think of something like, oh, my picture has disappeared. I'm going to put a picture up on the whiteboard. Uh, la, 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 la. And... This is related. There we go. This is related chemistry, and it's in two dimensions. So, um, what uh, what what's been done here is that. Let's see. I'm going to draw a circle around <coughs> this bit. What's been done here is that um, we've made a little organic molecule. The organic molecule is polyfunctional. It can attach to more than one uh, metal atom. And the, the way it attaches is to give you like three of these things attached to a single metal atom. And then there's space on the outside for more connections to happen. Well, if you let this go, then you can build up little triangles which attach to other triangles. And you can get these guys to make, uh, these are called Sierpiński uh, foams. Uh, the scans that I'm showing you here are atomic, I think they're atomic force microscopy scans. So these are actual single molecules that are two dimensional and are supported on a surface, uh, which, uh, and what we're seeing is these triangular pores of different sizes. Well, this is a two-dimensional version of a metal organic framework. And what can happen in metal organic frameworks is that you have uh, cavities of different sizes throughout a three-dimensional material. Why would you need this? Uh, one application is to separate CO2 out of waste gases. Right? If you have a material that uh, CO2 uh, can travel through, but nothing else can, uh, then you have a way of purifying CO2, sequestering it and using it. Let's say that you want your car to run on hydrogen in the future. Uh, filling up your um, gas tank with high pressure hydrogen is not really a safe way to go. If you had some sort of material that could absorb hydrogen and release it on demand, but like not explode if uh, someone taps your car in a fender bender, uh, that might be a kind of a cool thing. There's a lot of uh, different applications for these uh, metal organic frameworks, and they're essentially kind of designed from uh, the bottom up. Uh, they're related to ceramics, but uh, they also have a huge kind of organic component to them. Yeah, it seems that inorganic structures make sort of good cages. Yes. Um, I uh, I just a technical note on my screen. Uh, the whiteboard just appears to be a grid of blue squares. Ah, and it's not updated. Media. So so okay. Uh, so okay. So I'll I'll fix that on my end. Um, yep. It might be disabled because I've got it uh, muted. So, right. So you can just um, have it have the sound on have the sound on, but have the volume all the way down. Right. That right, way you right. don't get the feedback in your ears. Very good. Um, all right. I'm not sure what I just did there, but um, uh, uh, Kurt, uh, uh, wanna tell us a little bit about what maybe what you're working on or what some of your uh, favorite um, uh, 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 materials are lately. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the uh, areas of, of materials that I'm really interested in is called nanotechnology. Um, and this is, this is generally a field, um, again, it's one of these multidisciplinary fields. Um, I've worked with chemists, uh, chemists and biologists and engineers and all sorts of, of interesting people. Um, the idea is that 
Um, if you might be familiar with the periodic table. So this is uh, the, the way chemists organize the fundamental elements um, that exist in nature. And each element is given a spot on the periodic table because each element has unique properties. Um, and there's no two elements that are exactly the same. So, um, so if we start with that idea, um, it turns out that we can extend the periodic table in kind of new and interesting ways because we can take any element, um, gold for instance, or silver, um, and if we change the size of the, the particles that we're dealing with, we actually find that there's a change in the properties of the material. So think about, um, I mean, you know, if you're wearing jewelry, um, it might be gold. So think about taking that piece of jewelry and, and slicing off a very tiny sliver of, of gold and then taking that sliver of gold under a microscope and slicing off an even smaller sliver from that eventually you would get to a point where you physically couldn't be cutting it because it would be too small to even hold on to. Um, but when you get the size of the, when you get your particles to be on the, that contain on the order of say 10,000 atoms, we actually see that gold, which we are all familiar with properties of the element gold, um, those properties start to change. And in fact, just about all the properties change. And so if we think about choosing a material with certain properties, um, chemists are no longer limited to just the hundred elements on the periodic table, um, or you know, even one of the, the millions and millions of compounds that we've made. Um, we can now take just something as simple as an element lower the, the, the size of the particles to a point um, where we start to see different, different properties. Um, and let me, I wanna try and put, let's see if I can put something up on our, uh, on our screen here. That's a little um, spooky. It seems to imply that atoms know when they're in the uh, vicinity <laughs> of other atoms. <laughs> okay, so, well, they, they do know they're, uh, when they're in the presence of other atoms because atoms interact with each other. Um, they feel that they, they, there's attractive forces between atoms. And so, um, yeah, they, they actually can tell. Uh, atoms behave differently if they're on the surface of a material or if they're on, um, or if, or if they're on the interior. Yeah, um, or, in, or in solution or mm -hmm. something like that. Right. That's right. Yeah, very right. interesting. And, and so actually, it, it turns out this idea of, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to do two things at once. It turns out the, the idea of, here we go, um, of, of particles being on the interior versus the surface um, is, is in, plays a key role because the more surface atoms you have, um, the more your properties of, of the particle will be governed by those surface atoms a big chunk of gold is mostly governed by the uh the, the interior atoms because there's so many more atoms on the interior of a, a gold ring than there is on the surface so what i've put up here um on the screen is a, a, a just a, an example of how the melting point of gold changes so um, over on the right side when we have um particles that are very very large um, the, the melting point is about what you would expect for gold. It's about a thousand degrees Celsius. Um, but as the particles get smaller and smaller, um, we get down to a collection of, oh gosh, I want to say like a hundred atoms or so all packed together. Um, the melting point of those particle of those gold particles would be about room temperature. Um, it's and it's not just the melting point that changes its properties like um, the the color. Actually, gold um, when it's really small, the particles um, are going to be they can be kind of a grayish blue. They might be uh, they, they might be a red like a reddish wine color. Um, it, it the all kinds of properties change. So um, this gives us a whole new sort of opens a whole new door to designing different materials that, um, you know, that have desirable properties. Um, and you might say, well, you know, we already have things that can melt at room temperature. Oh yeah. So there's some pretty, some other pretty pictures. Um, 
you might say, you know, well, we already have plenty of, of materials. Uh, why do we need to think about nanoparticles and things like that? Well, um, we do have materials that do a lot of things that we like, but um, those materials might be expensive or they might be really toxic or, um, you know, they might not be, you know, readily available. Um, and so having more options is, is always a good idea. Um, and what we're, what we're seeing on this, what, um, uh, what I guess was that Matt that you posted this? Um, yeah, that was me. Okay, that was Mike. so um, yeah, so on the left we have a, a series of vials of um, that's probably cadmium selenide, which is a, a semiconductor. Um, the color of the solution changes um, from from purple. Well, actually, this is going to be probably the the fluorescence. So when you shine UV light on something like a black light, it glows. Um, these these particles glow a different color depending on their size. Um, so the smallest glows um, glows purple. The the largest um, grow, uh, glows glows red. Um, so I mean, there, there's lots of kind of neat things you can do with nanoparticles. I'm also as I've gotten into nanoparticles, one of the funny things we've discovered over the years is that, um, uh, like we were talking about earlier. Some materials are discovered just by accident, um, like buckyballs and carbon nanotubes. These are different arrangements of carbon atoms. Um, but it also turns out that those have existed. We, we've been making them every time we burn something in a fire. Like these, these nanotubes and, and, and graphene sheets, little tiny bits of them are, are made all the time when stuff burns. It's just kind of by accident. Um, what we also find is that there are a lot of naturally occurring um, clumps of atoms, clusters of atoms that we didn't think would exist in nature, but um, nature, nature has a really neat way of doing things that no one expects. Um, and so I've actually gotten into some of the uh, understanding more of how naturally occurring um, nanomaterials um, exist and how they form and, and what they do in the environment. Because um, if nature can make them in a way that's maybe more uh, efficient or with less pollution, um, then that might be a, a practice that we want to that we want to emulate with our industrial processes for making these materials. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that yes. completely makes sense. Kurt, you know, kind of what is the current status or thinking on uh, both um, uh, you know, Buck Minister Fullerene uh, that creates buckyballs and nanotubes and graphene. Uh, those were uh, both like really sexy about 10 years ago, but I'm not really sure what the, what the current thinking on them is. So do you have any thoughts about that? I think, you know, like a lot of things, um, it, it, it kind of actually reminds me of Second Life itself. Um, you know, you, there's like a big hype when the discovery is made and everybody thinks about how this material or something is going to transform the world. Um, and then, and, and, it, and it's, some of it's well-founded because it's, you know, it is an interesting material and, it, and it's, it's a new arrangement of atoms we've never seen before. Um, but then when it gets down into the details of, um, you know, how does this behave, how does this material um, operate in the human body? Is it toxic? Well, that, that maybe that ends up causing some trouble um, or, you know, there, there can just be some, some unexpected roadblocks that, uh, you know, that kind of undermine the, the, the hype. And, and, you know, if, if the hype was too much to begin with, then that's, that's kind of even worse. The, you know, you're, it's even harder to meet expectations. Um, I mean, I think graphene and, and carbon nanotubes and materials like that are still, they're still useful, but, you know, they might have been, they might have been overhyped, um, which wasn't necessarily their fault <laughs> or the, the scientists' fault. It was just sort of how the media got a hold of them and everybody's imagination ran away with them. Well, what, I'd say, go, I, yeah, please. Mike, I'm going to jump in there. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that uh, the graphene and the buckyballs and the um, the nanotubes are still undergoing the basic research. There are so many papers 
on them that uh, if you were trying to just to figure out what's going on with them, you'd be overwhelmed. Right. So uh, I, I took the liberty of just putting uh, one figure from one paper that I saw from my scan of the literature. It was like last night. There's the reference information. And it's uh, the title there is bottom up on surface synthesized armchair graphene nano ribbons. Uh, graphene seemed to be really, really useful and interesting to both chemists and physics uh, physicists uh, right now because they have uh, two-dimensional conductivity properties that uh, might be really useful in um, uh, computer chips. Uh, so, and in the figure I've uh, put up here, uh, you can kind of see what the structure of graphene is. It's like a one layer of graphite. Uh, people are still really excited about this. It's even worked its way into the chemical education literature because, um, you know, getting a chip of graphene is as simple as taking a piece of scotch tape, um, um, a, you know, getting some graphite on there, and then just like using two pieces of scotch tape to systematically peel um, away layer after layer. You do this about five or six times, you end up with just a monolayer of graphene. So, uh, and I know there's in modified electrodes, uh, which are useful for sensing uh, technologies, that um, carbon nanotubes are getting a lot of attention. So, yeah, it may be that there was a lot of hype initially, but I think that uh, it's gone quiet because the field is just so big now. Hmm. Yeah, so that, that makes sense, that um, there's just so much to look at that, uh, and it's gonna take some time to, you know, for it to sort of all sort out and for, uh, and for sort of meaningful applications to percolate up yep. in a sense. Um, now I, uh, I kind of want to uh, um, pause for a moment uh, to uh, look at our um, local chat, uh, maybe respond to some of the comments here. Um, scrolling back up, I wanted to uh, highlight something that uh, Day Miami mentioned, which is geology. Um, he says the American Geological Institute has lots of programs during Earth Science Week, and the theme was Earth Materials in Our Lives. And that uh, made me think that um, uh, that geological or natural processes or maybe processes in the universe um, can also reveal novel materials to us. Um, you know, the intense, uh, maybe intense pressures or temperatures you encounter in nature, um, we might discover um, uh, you know, um, surprising new materials that way. Um, any, any, any kind of thoughts about the, the, imp the impact of um, sort of natural forces in our discovery of new materials? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, naturally occurring, uh, I mean, I guess the, the forces that exist on Earth um, you know, we're used to what's on the surface of the earth and, you know, temp normal temperatures and pressures, but, uh, you know, we, we can find um, a, a lot of unusual types of materials at, say, the bottom of the ocean. Um, and, you know, because there's, there can be uh, intense pressures there from the water. Um, there can also be actually extremely high temperatures if you're near a, some kind of a thermal vent. Um, and, you know, so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in those environments um in part because of you get some very unusual life forms um living there and that you know maybe those are could be you know if we understood those we might better understand what you know what planets might have uh, life on them um but actually just the materials that that are found there are interesting in and of themselves because um they're the type of materials you could only make in a in a lab um, where you had, you know, very expensive instrumentation to get you, you know, very high temperatures and very high pressures. Uh, yes, thank you. That's, uh, that's great. Um, there's also some concern in the chat about um, maybe bad negative environmental effects that new materials might turn out to be 
you know, toxic to the environment or uh, maybe toxic to people. Um, uh, are there, um, uh, um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to address this, but I don't know if there are sort of protocols in place <laughs> to sort of maybe contain new materials, or it does seem to me that um, uh, uh, just by the very nature of the way um, new materials are developed, that it seems unlikely that uh, they're really going to be le be sort of <laughs> sort of released into the wild um, or, or or used in some application. Um, before we really understand their impacts, but that may not be the case. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Tagline points out, for example, that how uh, important uh, rare earth elements are, for example, in making mm -hmm. iPhones work. And um, and also, you know, we may, we may be using novel plastics in these products like an iPhone, and there are just millions and millions of those. And maybe we don't really know what, uh, what the long-term consequences will be. It does seem to me that, um, you know, one of the benefits of doing materials for science research might be to find um, replacements for rare earth elements or, or better replacements for uh, maybe toxic plastics and things like that. Well, even the replacements can be toxic, right? Because, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, interest in all organic LEDs, uh, light emitting diodes, uh, and the, the um, lanthanides tend to be, the rare earths uh, tend to be uh, used a lot for light emitting diode type. Um, uh, doping and uh, fabrication, uh, you know, but the problem, problem with a lot of um, materials uh, is their chemistry, yes, uh, but also just the size of them. So uh, nanoparticulate uh, materials uh, can be uh, problematic health-wise. Um, for example, uh, naturally occurring uh, nanoparticulate uh, materials include asbestos. Right? So things that asbestos can do uh, in terms of physically um, uh, interfering in cellular processes can also be done just by the virtue of the size and shape of uh, carbon nanotubes, perhaps, and other uh, particles. Um, Matt, you, uh, you mentioned naturally occurring um, substances. I've got a picture up that looks like a tile, but this is called a quasi-crystal. And this it, is a... It almost looks like an Arabic mosque tile. It is a... It's got five-fold symmetry, and the packing is such in five-fold symmetry that the pattern will never repeat. There are substances that look crystalline that do this. Uh, one of those um, is would be that uh, meta materials that you were interested in um, kind of outside our um, meeting. I will point out that uh, uh, in one meteorite, there's been like a discovery of an alloy of aluminum and I think it's titanium that um, has this sort of structure. So uh, we find things in the lab and then we find them out in the environment. Uh, uh, this was formed in, the ones I'm talking about were formed in space long ago. So. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to also mention um, that this idea of the toxicity of materials is something that, um, it, it's, it's actually something I've really started getting into um, recently. And, and along, one of my interests is, is chemistry of materials, but also um, I'm very interested in how to teach that subject to students. And so I like to design, uh, you know, experiments for, for, you know, college students, maybe high school students to, to play around with um, and, and learn about not only how to make these materials and the things they do, but also, um, you know, the things to be concerned about. So what I've put up on the screen here on the left are, um, oh, okay, you can only see the Hold on. Oh, oh thank you. Um, yeah, so Very on nice. the left, uh, there are a series of, of vials. I mentioned um, the gold nanoparticles change color. Well, these are, uh, uh, gold's also very expensive, so we don't have students play around with it much, but silver is, is significantly less expensive. Um, and so they can, it's very easy actually to make um, silver nanoparticles of different sizes. 
And as you go from left to right in that picture, um, from the light yellow to the brown to the, the gray, you're going from um, nano size silver up to, you know, just bulk, basically big chunks of, not big chunks, but flakes of silver floating around. Um, well, one of the things that silver, just any type of silver, um, is known for is its antibacterial properties. Um, and small uh, particles of silver are even more effective uh, against bacteria because it can, they're, they're small enough, they can actually slip into the cell and then destroy the cell from the inside. And, and once you do that, of course, the cell is, is dead. So it's very effective. Um, well, I mean, that's great if you want to have a, a bandage or you want to um, coat your medical instruments with silver nanoparticles, which is, which we do um, to, you know, to, to make uh, medicine safer. Um, and so that's great. But you also, you know, the silver doesn't dis, uh, discriminate against what type of cell it attacks. Um, it attacks pretty much every cell. And so one of the experiments that my students do is um, we we take some, some uh, very inexpensive uh, plants that you can get in an aquarium. Uh, they make some silver nanoparticles, which are very easy to make. Um, and then they plop down a, a little piece of this, uh, this aquarium plant into a vial of the silver nanoparticles. And we take it out a, a week later. And then they extract the chloroform from, I'm sorry, chloroform, chlorophyll. They extract the chlorophyll from it, the green pigment in the plants. And what we find is that the more nanoparticles you have um, in the solution um, and the smaller the nanoparticles are, um, the more toxic the, 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 the solution is. And so from, some le from left to right, you can see there's a stalk of healthy plant, one that's been uh, abused a little bit, and then the other on the, on the far right is, is completely dead and there's, you know, there was no chlor chlorophyll to, to extract. Um, and so, you know, yeah, this, th these materials are, are fantastic. Um, they do things that, that no other material can do. And they, they help, you know, they, they literally help mankind um, by helping us heal faster and, and be safer in a hospital. But, um, you know, they have a downside and it's something uh, that, that our students need to be aware of and everybody needs to be aware of because, you know, we have to make decisions um, as a, you know, as, as a country, as a society um, on how we want to use these and, and how we want to, how we want to regulate them. Um, uh, yeah. But I, I'll also add the other interesting thing is this is not um, universal. This is not a universal problem. If we substitute gold nanoparticles, um, they don't affect the plant at all. So it's, uh, it, it's <laughs> not, it, it, which makes it even more interesting, you know, from, from a scientific standpoint, like, wow, why does, why is one element nanoparticles really bad? Another element's nanoparticles not um, so yeah, there, there's, and there's still a lot we don't know about these materials. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that, um, you know, talk about interdisciplinary, perhaps one way to deliver, uh, silver, uh, to, to, a, to a diseased cell in a targeted fashion, mm -hmm. uh, you might be able to link it to uh, some kind of a monoclonal antibody directed to those cells. And then perhaps some have a chemical mechanism that could release the silver uh, once it's uh, found its target. Um, of course, there might be an issue with, you know, once you've killed the cell, how do you then clear it from the body so that the silver doesn't remain in the body in a toxic way or something, but one step at a time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I kind of want to try something a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit nutty here. I kind of want to do a lightning round um, because I do want to make sure with our time that we touch on some of the maybe um, uh, sexier new materials that have that have uh, made it into the uh, popular science press that people might be interested in. I kind of want to just go through and throw out some materials and have the two of you uh, just kind of remark on them, if you don't mind. And the first one I want to mention is aerogel. Um, so this is a, 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 a crazy new material that um, it seems to be getting a lot of interest. Um, it's sometimes referred to as frozen smoke made up of supercritical liquid gels of alumina, chromia, tin oxide, or carbon. It's 99% empty space, semi-transparent, etc. So do you guys, what do you guys think of aerogel? 
I love aerogels. <laughs> um, I've actually known about them for uh, close to 25 years now. Here's a uh, YouTube video from a guy named Niall Red, and he makes his own aerogel. Oh, fantastic. Uh, the, uh, so a set, how you make them is really cool. Um, think you can, you can make a jello version of glass, right? Um, you can, you can take uh, that chemical is like, uh, oh, um, uh, some sort of orthosilicate, whatever. It doesn't matter what the chemical is called, uh, but um, you can take a source of um, uh, silicon and a um, acid and um, combine them um, in such a way that the silicon starts to polymerize. It forms SIO, SIO links in three dimensions. And literally, it becomes like jello. Uh, there's a lot of solvent in the network trapped in between the SIO links. So here's that's that's a problem. That's where all the mass comes, and all that solvent is supporting the jello. So you gotta take your jello chunk, which can be any shape. It depends on the container you use, and you put it into um, a pressure container and fill it with a uh, supercritical fluid. Uh, and that supercritical fluid is one that um, is a, uh, you've got a solvent of some sort, could even be carbon dioxide, um, and you've got it under pressure and temperature high enough so that the distinction between gas phase and liquid phase is physically lost. And then you slowly, slowly, slowly vent the carbon uh, dioxide. So there's never any um, transition experienced by the, by the material between the liquid and solid. So essentially, it's a way of uh, washing out all the stuff caught in the gel. Yeah, and, that, so that, that's where the drying comes in. It's it's dry. Yeah, I it's, never really had not, that had part. not really that had not really clicked with me. Right, right, right. Yeah. So getting getting all that stuff out is the main problem, and if you do it right, you're left with uh, a shape that is like the size and shape of your original mold, um, but has all of the mass pretty much gone. It's just got the network left. Uh, it's mostly empty space, and you know a thin um, a thin plate of this stuff you can hold in one hand, and you can hold a blowtorch in the other hand, and like fire it at you know a half inch plate of this stuff, and you know your first hand holding it is doesn't feel any heat. Yeah, it's a, it's a super insulator. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, yeah. the it would be lovely if there were better ways of making this stuff. Uh, I have a colleague who uh, has spent. Uh, about 20 years trying to make this stuff um, with uh, student preps and trying to get easier ways of making it. And uh, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, the uh, next material I want to mention is meta materials. And uh, these uh, uh, made it into the popular press because they, um, uh, they can sort of create invisibility cloaks um, and with and have unusual optical properties. Um, um, let me see. Um, um, are you all familiar? Any any thoughts about? I'm not quite sure uh, how these things work, but they appear to uh, have optical properties that can, um, you know, bend light around them to uh, uh, make objects behind them disappear. Have you seen anything like this? I think I think the same principle that makes uh, butterflies' wings all those different colors without pigments. It's all mm. refraction. I think the same principle holds um, that essentially, if you make a, a nanostructure that can bend light in the right way, you can bend light around an object so you don't see it anymore. Um, the ones I've seen are only good for certain wavelengths, and some of them are good for like microwaves. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. That's what that's consistent with what I'm uh, uh, looking at here. So, so you could have yeah. radar resistant 
um, the, um, stuff, the, but you know, stealth, still see stealth the bombs, plane. stealth <laughs> bombers, I guess, and things like yeah. that. Right. Though so our, our our president believes the bombers are in fact actually invisible. The, um, the so light, the light, yeah, it, it strikes the surface, and then instead of ricocheting off like most light will do on on materials, it will kind of, it, it, from my understanding, sort of skim along the surface and um you know i, I think see. that's that's one reason why if you you know when you see a picture of the of a stealth bomber it's got all these like smooth edges and it's kind of curved and the idea is that on these, these smooth curved surfaces the the radar sort of just skims along the surface and 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 um go, goes around the material instead of bouncing off um, and going back to the the radar detector, um, uh-huh. but yeah, they, these are these are pretty pretty unusual materials, um, and yeah, I don't know a whole lot about them. Yeah, I think I think they're well, yeah, I think they're pretty new actually. Uh, okay, next one is amorphous metals, which are uh, metals with a disordered atomic structure. Um, they can be up to twice the strength of steel, and they can disperse impact energy very effectively. Um, uh, I think amorphous metals are already being used in some uh, commercial and um, uh, uh, um, uh, applications. Um, in fact, uh, I once worked on a project for just a regular men's razor that was going to be made of amorphous metals for some reason. <laughs> I think the inventor just thought they were cool. <laughs> um, but uh, any, any thoughts about amorphous metals? Have you seen any, uh, any buzz about those? So the quasi crystals I put up are essentially an example of the amorphous metals. Right. Uh, so uh, let me see if I can put that back up again. Um, one of the features about amorphous metals is that uh, if you think of like the largest atoms in there, all packing as close as they can together, there's going to be a lot of space between atoms, right? Because spheres can only pack so close together. So what if you have a uh, material that's um, got several different kinds of atoms? So um, that the smaller atoms can fit within the gaps between the bigger atoms. Maybe you have even some tinier atoms in there that can fit in between the, those, those gaps left uh, behind. Uh, those those um, alloys essentially will be kind of much denser and um, uh, atoms can kind of knock around together a little more efficiently. I've seen the thing where you have like a steel ball bearing and one of these amorphous metal ball bearings and they look identical until you drop them. The steel bounces. The amorphous metal just goes plop as if it's a sandbag. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So it basically disperses the energy and doesn't like reflect it back in any organized way. It probably just turns it into heat or something. So do the, imagine the, taking a bullet with that. So do the, the smaller atoms that are kind of bouncing around between the larger atoms in there, is, are those what absorb the, the extra energy? So that I the, think they the help. material doesn't they, bounce back? Yeah, I think what happens is that uh, they help disperse the energy uh, rather than having it go through a close packed mm-hmm. uh, crystal struct crystal lattice, yeah, uh, the, the the successive uh, waves, I guess, of of energy that are absorbed get uh, refracted and deflected more. Yeah, it just turns into heat more. Hmm. Well, one thing I also want to make sure we touch on uh, before our time is up is battery technology. I feel like. Um, uh, batteries are going to be critical to uh, a successful transition to a post-carbon world. Um, the problem, it seems to me, is that our knowledge of how uh, molecules transfer electrons is exquisite. Um, and, you know, we understand that chemistry extremely well. Um, and the, the downside of that is that that makes it really, it seems to kind of limit 
uh, the options we have for really developing uh, better, like rechargeable batteries or way to store electricity um, um, in a post-carbon world. So I'm very curious to know what each of you think about um, what the prospects are for uh, improvements in battery technology. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, the you know, batteries are becoming obviously more useful um, and, and more needed given the, the types of technology that we're developing, even you know, um, you know, uh, cars that don't run on, on gasoline and things like that require some type of battery. Um, you know, and, and we, this gets back to, you know, why are we developing new materials at all? Um, because, you know, replacing gasoline with something that, uh, that can store, I mean, gasoline stores energy. That's, that's what, a, a all that energy is stored in the gasoline molecules. That's we, the beauty. The beauty of fossil fuels is that right. all that energy is just packed in and all we have to do is light it on fire. That's right. Well, <laughs> so, I mean, you can think fire. about, you know, we just need a, a, we need another material, um, that doesn't, uh, you know, emit CO2 when we use it, um, that, that also stores energy just as well. Um, and, you know, maybe even isn't flammable like gasoline or doesn't evaporate or, you know, isn't uh, toxic to us. So that might even, you know, be better than gasoline. But, you know, these are the, these are the types of things that we, we need new materials for. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, what we sometimes find is that um, the, the, the best materials that could replace gasoline um, or that, you know, can generate energy from the sun um, you know, are themselves toxic, like, you know, solar energy panels are, um, you know, it, it, they're difficult to recycle and there's a lot of a waste in, in, in creating them. Um, ultimately, they're probably better um, than, than burning fossil fuels, but, uh, you know, the materials that go into them can be, uh, can be difficult to, to, to process. Um, my, uh, oh, go ahead, Mike, go ahead, please. So Sizzy brings up some really good um, points in the uh, chat uh, about fuel cells. Uh, so, um, for example, taking solar energy or wind energy or uh, renewable energies, um, they're not always available on demand. So energy storage is a huge problem. Uh, and, you know, making lithium batteries or making batteries uh, themselves uh, isn't the 100% best uh, way of storing uh, the energy. And, you know, as has been pointed out, gasoline is such a uh, energy dense material uh, that it's, uh, you know, very hard to get away from. Uh, energy storage by taking like solar energy, for example, and using an electrochemical cell to make a fuel like methanol or methane or H2. Um, is an active area of uh, research because, uh, uh, you know, if you have methanol, for example, you can just store it in a drum until you need it. Uh, if you can make a electrochemical cell that makes the fuel from solar energy, artificial for the synthesis, essentially, uh, and then can um, retrieve the methanol and you burn it in a, another electrochemical cell, a fuel cell, uh, a, you're not using fire uh, and uh, running up against the thermodynamics of temperature differences uh, to get the energy out. And uh, B, you've got electricity on demand and all you get out is the original CO2 and uh, H2 uh, or H2O that you uh, put in. So yeah, there's a lot of research on taking things like uh, CO2 and turning them into uh, uh, fuels. Uh, and splitting water, uh, we, can, we can make hydrogen really easily. Platinum is wonderful. Uh, single atom um, catalysts where we basically got single atoms of platinum dispersed on the surface of other uh, materials for our uh, H2 formation. That's an active area of research. What's really, um, what's really driving a lot of research today is uh, the other part of the reaction, making oxygen, that there, there's a lot of problems with making oxygen from water. It, that's the energy intensive part. Uh, I see. Um, Vic mentions uh, the development of solid state batteries. 
Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that? I thought lithium ion batteries were solid state. Am I wrong about that? Or, or what's the difference between a solid state battery and a conventional battery? Hmm. Yes. The, um, so, so a conventional battery, uh, even one that's uh, solid state, just doesn't have a lot of liquid in it. All the materials are pretty, like would appear pretty dry to you if, uh, if you took them, took them out. But there is just enough in there um, to uh, facilitate uh, diffusion of like lithium plus ions. Um, if through the material so that charge can um, transport. There are other mm -hmm. materials that are like solids as defined by having like a, you know, single crystal structure through which ions can diffuse. Uh, and uh, I think it's this kind of small distinction um, that, uh, that is being made uh, in, in this case. If you have a solid, it's really hard for ions to diffuse through a solid. And it's the ions inside a battery that carry charge. Electrons don't move around inside a battery. It's, it's I, all ionic. Right? Um, so, is, there a, is there a method for the direct flow of electrons um, independent of an ion? Uh, could you, yeah, is, well, that's uh, what happens outside would, like, the battery. Right. So the negative charges move through the wire outside the battery. Yes. And usually it's either um, atoms which have a negative charge or atoms which have a positive charge, which are moving around inside the battery um, to m balance the charges. Right. So it's only at the electrodes surfaces where the electrons are generated. Um, you know, within, away from the electrode surface, charge is balanced just by the movement of, of atoms. And that's what makes it slow, and that's what builds up resistance inside a battery. Uh, so that's why uh, some of these solid state batteries are so thin, so that you can have a lot of surface area for the electrodes to build up a lot of current and have a very little resistance in between the electrodes. Um, tagline mentions that what we really need are, uh, you know, high capacity capacitors to store electricity as opposed to batteries that generate um, uh, electricity. Um, uh, are you guys aware of um, any research into just the sheer storage of m materials for the sheer storage of electricity? Well, I think I think these solid state electrolytes that uh, or the, the solid state um, elect, uh, batteries are um, very close to being a uh, super capacitor of that kind. Because oh, really, it's again mm. just building up electrons and then stabilizing the electrons that are sitting on the electrode mm. with positive charges on one, I guess, negative charges on the other. So you still have to have ions in, uh, in between that move around. Huh, well, that's, uh, that actually sounds very encouraging. Perhaps on that uh, sort of upbeat note, um, I, we're just past the hour now. So um, uh, uh, maybe uh, before we end, um, uh, Kurt, do you have any final thoughts or, or comments you'd like to make before we wrap up? Um, well, you know, I, I thought I might just mention, um, you know, kind of in the it, looking towards the future, um, getting back to the idea of basic research as a foundation for, for new applied research. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm hopeful and very interested to see how it develops is the, the convergence of different disciplines um, like nanotechnology and computing um, biotechnology and uh, the cognitive science, neuroscience. We're, we're approaching a point when ideas from one of these disciplines will be able to uh, be applied to another discipline. And so we're getting, this is where we get to things like computer brain interfaces, uh, which would require you to understand how a brain works and how computer works and 
how to you know get the information to flow from a, a biological system to a, a, a you know a computer system. We can't do that now, but we will in, in the near future. We're, we're we will um, just because we we have done a lot of the basic research uh, along the way. Yes, that's right. I think um, we are uh, really um, approaching. Um, uh, an era of real synergy in various disciplines in science that um, uh, is going to be very exciting. So, and awesome. uh, Mike, any, any. And uh, tell you more about the future. Think about old school materials, stone, ceramics, glass, bronze, and steel. Uh, we've, lived with those for thousands and thousands of years. And in the uh, past century or so, we've got a lot of information about like how they really work. And uh, these old school materials are going to be inspirations and useful themselves for uh, the future. All right, uh, I like that, I like that, uh, uh, the, 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 the perspective uh, uh, of, uh, of that point of view. Very good. All right. Well, uh, Kurt and Mike, thank you very much for um, joining us, uh, taking time out of your day to uh, talk with us and with our students today. I think everyone really enjoyed it. So I wanted, and I want to also uh, thank the Science Circle and Chantal and Jess who, who uh, organized this and, uh, and Edith for promoting it and all of their hard work. And uh, with that, I will gavel us to a close. Have a good weekend, you all. all right. Happy Thank Halloween. You, Matt. Happy Thank Halloween. Thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you. That was really enjoyable. Awesome. Thank you.